And I'd like to thank you all very much for coming. Um, again, this is an amazing crowd. I'm, I'm so happy you are all here. And I'd like to present Dr. Cooper White, who will be giving our presentation. Good evening. This is a wonderful turnout. And um, I am just so impressed with the student committee that has organized this whole series of events with their passion and dedication to ending violence against women and raising awareness, culminating in the vagina monologues, but all the events leading up to that uh, wonderful event in this community, which is a real important first, and so I'm very excited. Um, this evening's lecture also is kind of um, poignant bookends for me. Uh, I gave a version of this lecture, an earlier version of this lecture, as my interview lecture when I came to interview for the position of associate professor here. And so um, they hired me anyway, <laughs> which is kind of a testament, I think, to the forward-looking visionary and prophetic qualities of this seminary and this community. Um, and so you're all a part of that, and you continue to be a part of that. So tonight, this will not be an easy lecture. Um, some of the material, as Virginia said, like the vagina monologues itself, is um, difficult, it's touchy. Um, some of the visuals that you'll see will be, um, if not exactly explicit uh, sexually, they certainly imply plenty, and they are, uh, some of them, quite violent. So um, be good to yourself as you watch this material. I do want to say, if you need to step out, if you need to hold the hand of a friend, be centered. Um, do whatever you need to do to take care of yourself as we talk about these difficult issues. But it is important that we talk about them, and that's the reason to have this event tonight. All right, so the title of this lecture tonight is Gender, Power, and Pastoring the People of God. Why talk about gender and power? Why name gender in the context of a lecture on pastoral care? Why do I always talk about these things in the second week of the Intro to Pastoral Care course? One reason for talking about gender tonight, and for those of you who are here um, as a member of one of the pastoral care courses this semester, uh, a reason for talking about gender in the pastoral care curriculum is because pastoral care includes caring for persons throughout the life cycle involving choices and actions that reach into the heart, the very heart of our own gendered nature, which is our sexuality. But I'm also spending time uh, to focus carefully on the topic of gender because it is important to situate our pastoral work within a contextual awareness. That as women and men, we do not come either as givers or receivers of care with the same experiences or perspectives. I want to begin with this very simple matter of perspective. Whether by nature or by nurture, we, women and men, are all sitting here in the same room, but we are not sitting in the same reality. Reality is socially constructed. Since we don't all have the same social experiences or even the same access to the agora, the marketplace of social dealings, we don't have equal access to the reality constructing process. Tonight we're focusing on gender, but we might just as well be focusing on race, or class, or sexual orientation, or physical ability, or age. Some groups have the authority to build and name reality for others. And although there is change, as evidenced by the presence of so many women here tonight who are in professional roles and preparing for ministry or other forms of leadership, and we have both a woman and a black man as the two top candidates for the Democratic presidential nomination this year, it is still mostly the case that reality is built and named in our society by mostly white men and only a small percentage of mostly white women. Individual women are left with a terrible double bind. If reality is defined by men or by the individual man with whom a woman is relating, then a woman must choose between convincing herself 
that the other's reality is the real one or clinging perilously to her own perceptions and exposing herself to ridicule, ostracism, or worse. Her reality is non-reality, if this over here is reality. S to choose her reality, therefore, is to be delusional. I'll give you a concrete example. Some time ago, I was taking a much needed day off. I went into the city to just roam around and play tourist and get a haircut. At the hairdressers, I was sitting like something out of the Jetsons with rods and pieces of tin foil sticking out of my head and with a drab unisex robe draped around my shoulders. And suddenly, I took a good look at a fashion poster that was propped up on the display uh, counter in front of the shampoo station. It was a black and white fashion photograph of a woman with her hair blown across her face. You've probably seen lots of those. We're going to see a couple tonight. Her face was turned unnaturally to one side as if it had been slapped, and her eyes had a dull, staged, and provocative look similar to pornography. Her clothes were half pulled off her body. And even with all of that, I wasn't particularly clued in that there was anything disturbing about that photograph because that's what high fashion photographs look like, right? And then I saw that her shoulder was obviously visibly bruised. In this day and age of airbrushed perfection, that bruise could be no accident. I looked and blinked, and I couldn't fathom what I was seeing or why. And the story isn't even over yet. I walked out of my appointment a while later and went to retrieve my car. While the parking attendant went with my key to get my car, I noticed a picture tacked up over his workstation. Except for a small calendar with no pictures on it, this was the only decoration decoration on his wall. It was a homemade Xerox collage of nude female mannequins lying down at various angles with arms and legs chopped off and photographic faces of real women superimposed where the heads would have been. Again, I looked and blinked and couldn't fathom what I was seeing or why, or what I would feel if I let myself, and then what in the world I was supposed to do about it. My socially constructed reality said, it's nothing, forget it, so what? My real, that is socially delusional reality said, today I have seen two photographs of violence against women as style and as decoration. I'm a woman and this makes me feel very targeted and vulnerable. Well, what's a girl to do? I shook my newly permed hair, got in my car and drove home. Whatever protest I might have felt was silenced by the utter banal normality of both situations. To speak up would have been to be a troublemaker, a crazy woman, a fury. Now I did later go back and ask the garage owner about the collage, but not until I had told this story in the context of teaching a class in a seminary and who, by believing me, provided me with a validation of the reality of my experience. It was this very important context of an alternative consensual reality that gave me the courage to go back and confront what I had seen. I've been asked why I've written and taught so much about violence against women specifically. Why not just talk about violence, period? In one sense, all violence, whether against women or men, girls or boys, is all connected, and I will get back to that later. Violence is never acceptable, and the pain and horror of a boy who is molested, a man who is raped, mugged, or murdered should not be minimized in any way. These are horrors that deserve to be spoken about and condemned. The main reason why we need to talk about violence against women, then, is because of the gendered nature of all our experiences, including violence. And there are certain particular aspects to violence against women that deserve our focused attention in order to be competent, gender-sensitive pastoral caregivers and advocates for prevention. The first of these two aspects that I'm going to talk about tonight is proportionality. Far more girls and women are disproportionately victims of certain types of violence, particularly sexual assault, sexual abuse, and intimate partner violence. One out of four girls is sexually assaulted before the age of 18, 
and one out of five to six boys. 17% of women are raped in their lifetimes. That's one out of six women. And 3% or one in 33 men. 90% of rape victims are female. The most recent national statistics show that 85 to 89% of all victims of intimate relationship violence are women, resulting in somewhere between 875,000 to over 1 million reported incidents of domestic violence in the U.S. every year, over a million. Other estimates are as high as 3 million incidents per year, partly because of underreporting. Approximately one in five high school girls report physical or sexual abuse by a dating partner. And the most recent large-scale study, sponsored jointly by the National Institute of Justice and the Centers for Disease Control, found that 25% of women have been raped or assaulted by an intimate partner compared to 7.5% of men. The authors of this study, published in 2000, also stated Women experience more chronic and injurious physical assaults at the hands of intimate partners than do men. These findings suggest that research aimed at understanding and preventing intimate partner violence against women should be stressed. More men are murdered. There's a difference here too, however. 30% of female homicide victims are killed by an intimate partner compared to only 5% of male victims, and that statistic has remained relatively stable for decades. As many as a third of emergency room visits by women are for injuries from domestic assaults. And the March of Dimes once determined that battering of women during pregnancy causes more birth defects than all the diseases for which children are immunized combined. In 1993, the American Medical Association and the Surgeon General both named violent men as a major threat to women's health. The issue of international traffic in women and girls enslaved by prostitution rings is only now coming to light in the general media in spite of a United Nations Convention for the Suppression of Traffic in Persons dating back almost 60 years and concern by feminist advocates for 150 years. The UN estimates that trafficking is a five to seven billion dollar operation annually, mostly with women and children as its victims. An analysis of several school shooting incidents reveals something that the news media also have not emphasized. All the shooters have been boys or young men, and with the exception of Columbine High School, most of the people actually killed have been girls and women. Many of these incidents were triggered by the boy's perceived rejection by a girlfriend or an imagined girlfriend. In other words, a massive version of what we are now coming to recognize as something called separation attack. Separation attack occurs in a battering relationship when the woman attempts to leave the relationship, and we are now aware that this begins as early as the teen years. 75% of injury assaults and 45 to 50% of murders of intimate partners occur just as a woman is leaving or has recently left her batterer. This is now being understood by researchers of domestic violence as the dynamic of power and control at its peak. The batterer's sense of dominion is ultimately threatened by the woman's assertion of her own safety and autonomy, and so he uses the ultimate form of violence as a last-ditch effort to regain his sense of control. Perhaps the most significant issue of proportionality, then, concerns who is committing violent crimes. 82 to 90 percent of perpetrators of all violent crimes are men. In 2006, the most recent year's statistics published by the FBI, 90.9 percent of all murders of both women and men were committed by men. So the issue becomes one of male violence, of which we are all, to varying degrees, both women and men, socialized to protect ourselves against, to fear, and to avoid. There's a second, perhaps even more compelling reason, however, why we must speak in the particular about violence against women, and that is to break silence, to accurately name these various forms of violence, Violence against men is commonly understood in our culture as violence, a crime, a violation of a person's rights. Violence against women, however, in all its forms, is too often called something else. We call sexual harassment just a little joke, 
a little flirting, or making a mountain out of a molehill. We call rape seduction, a case of a woman being in the wrong place at the wrong time, being somewhere she should know better, or perhaps uh, asking for it by drinking too much, wearing the wrong outfit, or being seductive. We call battering poor communication skills, poor impulse control on the part of the batterer. We call it masochism in the woman, or if we're really psychologically sophisticated, we call it a problem in the family system for which she is also responsible. Or if we're of a more Freudian bent, we call it repetition neurosis, in which she is compulsively recreating abusive conditions from her childhood and acting out by seeking inappropriate partners. Why is denial such a powerful force? In an important book entitled Trauma and Recovery, Dr. Judith Herman of Harvard Medical School has written, to study psychological trauma means bearing witness to horrible events. When the events are natural disasters or so-called acts of God, those who bear witness sympathize readily with the victim. But when the traumatic events are of human design, those who bear witness are caught in the conflict between victim and perpetrator. It is morally impossible to remain neutral in this conflict. The bystander is forced to take sides. It is very tempting, she says, to take the side of the perpetrator. All the perpetrator asks is that the bystander do nothing. He appeals to the universal desire to see, hear, and speak no evil. The victim, on the contrary, asks the bystander to share the burden of pain. The victim demands action, engagement, and remembering. After every atrocity, one can expect to hear the same predictable apologies. It never happened. The victim lies. The victim exaggerates. The victim brought it upon herself. And in any case, it is time to forget the past and move on. The more powerful the perpetrator, the greater in his prerogative to name and define reality, and the more completely his arguments prevail." End of quote. In order for individual victims to be met with justice and restitution, it takes a great deal of effort from the widest possible circle of bystanders, a social context of belief and action. Herman writes again, in the absence of strong political movements for human rights, the active process of bearing witness inevitably gives way to the active process of forgetting. Repression, dissociation, and denial are phenomena of social as well as individual conscience, consciousness. So let's just take a pause for a moment. It may seem like I've strayed pretty far from the issue of gender and pastoral care. But one nexus between the practice of ministry as a caring profession, or the practice of any profession for that matter, and the subject of gender, power, and violence against women is in the arena of sexual harassment. Sexual harassment intersects with the practice of ministry in two ways. Both how we conduct ourselves in relation to those who are in our care, and also how we respond to the stories of those who have been victimized and come to us for help. A thoughtful example of examination of sexual harassment can offer us an instructive example about the differing realities of women and men. Because of the prevalence of violence against women, both in the images of women that surround us everywhere we go, and we're going to examine that a little more in detail, and in real life, no woman knows whether any particular instance of supposedly mild, even joking sexual harassment will or will not escalate into more serious harassment, unwanted physical touching, stalking, or even rape. Men who actually have little more on their minds than relieving a little sexual tension with a dirty joke are often baffled to be told that this behavior is inappropriate because they don't recognize the more threatening context within which many women experience their behavior. But given the context of so many other forms of violence against wom women, a woman may always wonder, who knows how far this man might go? Who knows if it's harmless or not? This is precisely the reasoning behind the modern reasonable woman judicial standard for assessing the validity of sexual harassment claims in court. In a landmark case in 1991, Ellison versus Brady, this is very interesting, these were Reagan appointees, politically conservative federal appellate court judges 
established this reasonable woman standard with the following historic statement. We believe that in evaluating the severity and pervasiveness of sexual harassment, we should focus on the perspective of the victim. If we only examined whether a reasonable person would engage in allegedly harassing conduct, we would run the risk of reinforcing the prevailing level of discrimination. Harassers could continue to harass merely because a particular discriminatory practice was common, and victims of harassment would have no remedy. We therefore prefer to analyze harassment from the victim's perspective. We realize that there is a broad range of viewpoints among women as a group, but we believe that many women share common concerns which men do not necessarily share. And then they continue with a quotation from social science researchers describing the prevailing societal context as one, quote, where rape and sex-related violence have reached unprecedented levels and a vast pornography industry creates continuous images of sexual coercion, objectification, and violence. Now, even in situations where we, as women on the receiving end of harassment, are pretty sure it won't escalate into violence, we experience the eroding of self-confidence, self-worth, and a feeling of adult well-being. Almost every clergywoman alive has experienced gender harassment by male colleagues. When I first moved to Chicago and was being introduced around my new diocese, I was called a girl, a little lady, and believe it or not, a chicky poo by other clergy. A very high-ranking bishop some time ago, who will remain nameless, responded to a professional comment of mine. I was thanking him, ironically, for something that he had said on behalf of advocacy for women. And he responded by telling me how he loved the color of my hair, and it was just like his daughter's. I had greeted him as a colleague, and he responded to me as a sexualized daughter. Now, we can say that this stuff is no big deal in and of itself, but the constant drip, drip, drip of hearing such remarks at virtually every gathering of clergy or analogously other professional settings begins to take on more seriousness. It says, I don't see you as a colleague. It also feels like it says, you don't belong here, go back home where you do belong. Power, of course, is expressed in many ways besides sexual harassment, including in settings of ministry. In some ways, sexual harassment is just the tip of the iceberg. Researchers have observed that power is expressed by who initiates touching, thereby presuming to enter into the other person's body space. Who stands closer to whom? Who takes up more personal space? For example, who sits in a more open posture, legs open or arms stretched out, and who sits more contained, taking up less space? Who controls time? Who is more likely to use familiarities of address first? Who makes jokes at the other's expense? Who chooses topics of discussion? Who interrupts more? Even such subtle behaviors as more relaxation, greater use of gesture, less tilting of the head, less smiling, and less eye aversion all subliminally communicate power, authority, and control. These power behaviors also happen to be stereotypical characteristics of masculine behavior, and they also happen to be common characteristics of the behavior of white persons of either gender toward persons of color. The question of power is where, for me, the entire argument in favor of an essentialist view of masculine and feminine differences falls down. Yes, my husband will drive three miles out of his way to avoid asking directions, while I'll jump out at the first available service station and strike up a relationship. In such matters, masculine and feminine differences are almost cute. His self-sufficiency and independence, my resourcefulness and relationality, much ink has been spilled over the last two decades about the characteristic or so-called essential differences with which men and women relate, communicate, and make moral judgments. The thrust of such research is to validate difference and to show that women should not be assessed by male norms and standards. But it begs the question of how uncritical acceptance of these differences as natural may also perpetuate power, dominance, and striking inequality in the name of natural law and what is normal. It also begs the question concerning the poisonous and often unrecognized effects 
these differences have on men. Stress-induced heart attacks and ulcers have long been associated more with men than women. A study by the Washington University Medical School reports that although twice as many women as men attempt suicide, at least 200,000 attempts a year, which speaks volumes about women's depression, 75% of the 30,000 completed suicides each year are men. Part of this is due to the more violent, immediately lethal methods of suicide chosen by men. But Dr. George Murphy, Professor Emeritus of Psychiatry at Washington U, further attributes men's more deadly rate of suicide to their socialization not to reach out for help or to talk about feelings, to become emotionally isolated, and to dismiss the need for support with an over-reliance on logic, stoicism, and self-sufficiency. Surely this has relevance for the most rudimentary sorts of pastoral care, inviting and creating an atmosphere of permission for men to share their inner thoughts, moods, and feelings, and creating better networks of friendship and support to counter some of the internal and external pressures to conform to a stoic, life-denying expectation in the name of being a man. Now, essentialism takes two forms, nature and nurture. Sometimes this results in a debate. Are gender differences more due to biology, that's the nature argument, or to socialization, that's the nurture argument? The more hardcore essentialists would say that gender differences are hardwired into the human species through our biology. These researchers assert that through a combination of X and Y chromosomes, hormones, and brain chemistry, little boys really do prefer trucks from birth, and little girls really are more adept at conversation. There's a few chairs right up in the front here. The obvious and frightful, frightening pitfall of this thinking, if taken too far, is akin to the 19th century biology research where they actually weighed brains and determined that a woman's brain was too small for intellect and consigned her to the kitchen, the bedroom, and the nursery. By that estimation, dolphins would be far ahead of all of us. It also parallels the frightening implications of the book The Bell Curve on the Genetics of Intelligence for Racial Discrimination and Racism in this country. Not only scientists eager to uphold theories of male superiority embrace the such theories about gender. Many women, some with quite spiritual arguments, are celebrating women's supposedly more nurturant, close-to-the-earth, intuitive nature. No matter how you gussy the argument up, however, even with the blessings of the goddess, it's still essentialism. And it can lead right back to such notions as girls are less innately capable in math and science, so they should concentrate on areas at which they excel, and so forth. This can lead to essentialism at its most fascistic. Myths about woman, like all myths, are often founded in some biological reality. However, biology is not destiny. Sorry, Sigmund. Individual women as persons are much more than just the biologies, the biological realities of our lives. Yes, women menstruate, make love, miscarry, give birth, nurse babies, have hot flashes. We feel the ebb and flow of hormones like the lunar tide in great cycles over the lifespan. Women also read and write books, drive buses and tractors, perform surgery, conduct orchestras, manage businesses and governments, and celebrate the Eucharist. <laughs> Images that focus only on women's biological realities confine women's lives to the level of myth, just as a stereotype in the literal sense of the word can only produce a single picture. But now, falling over entirely onto the nurture or socialization side of the nature-nurture debate doesn't provide us with a quick fix by any means. I think there's no question that boys and girls are socialized differently from birth, maybe even before birth, as parents begin to imagine what color they're going to paint the room. Strong psychoanalytically-based arguments have been made that as long as women are the primary caretakers of small children, woman, capital W, will be identified with providing, or as is inevitable, not always providing, our most basic survival needs. Psychoanalytic thinkers steeped in Kleinian theory, including Nancy Chodoro and Dorothy Dinnerstein, and feminist theorists like Carolyn Merchant at the University of California, 
have shown an unconscious link between mother, breast, and nature, or in another version, woman, bodily functions, and death. These theorists suggest that at a pre-verbal and primal stage, we are programmed to meet mother as an object, an it, whereas we meet father somewhere later in the process as a subject, an I. At the most primitive level of our socially constructed but perhaps biologically influenced psyche, power is therefore invoked to keep woman, nature, the body, and ultimately mortality contained and under control. These authors advocate a major overhauling of our social and sexual arrangements and in particular a more equal sharing of early parenting by both men and women. If we try to take the theory of socialization and gender differences back to the professional setting, however, it's not that simple. We find it doesn't work to attempt, as some secular management training programs have done, merely to teach women how to behave more assertively, that is, more like men. <laughs> women who either consciously or unconsciously behave in ways that communicate more power and authority are often ostracized or treated to a range of more overt power behaviors intended to put them back in their place. Myths are constructed to explain the world, and more to the point, to try to control forces that are perceived as mysterious and threatening. It can be argued at the deepest place in the collective psyche, the place that shapes the dominant masculine constructed reality, woman is such a mysterious force. Think of Freud's question, what do women want? <laughs> Societal and cultural myths attempting to control women's power serve to lock unique individual persons, both women and men, into stereotypes that are constricting, damaging, and ultimately death-dealing. This leads to the last segment of my talk this evening about the images of women that surround us in our culture. Women as imaged in Euro-American culture become icons for sale, valued as objects for their own sake. Barbie dolls, centerfolds, those silvery nude women on the mud flaps of trucks. These images instruct both men and women, particularly at our formative teen years, what a real woman should be like. A young it woman with vacant eyes, large breasts that never sag, a frail, even anorexic waistline, a body that complies uncomplainingly no matter what you do to it. If pornography is defined not merely by erotic content, but by a standard of dehumanization and objectification of women, then a preponderance of mainstream media images of women are in fact pornographic. So we're going to go to these images now. There's actually several categories that I've been looking at these for a long time and uh, I, I'm hoping that out of this lecture you will become more sensitive readers of images of persons in uh, all the different media that we have in our society. The first category is women as things, objects for use or trophies. This was a card that was being handed out on the street um, in Chicago for a diner called Iggy's. And if you look carefully at this image, um, what is she proportional to here? The salt shakers and the ashtray, right. In fact, she's right next to the ashtray, which suggests that she is a cigar, and she can be consumed and then snuffed out. Uh, also, the salt shakers are fairly obvious in their imagery there. Um, again, the commodification of a person on the table with other objects. The uh, Jean-Paul Gaultier perfume bottle, which is a woman's torso, headless, no person there, just a body, sexualized body. And here you have also um, kind of uh, references to S&M culture, punk culture with the piercing and the tattoos. <coughs> this one is an interesting one to an analyze through Foucaultian uh, analysis. If, if you think about Foucault's idea about things that get inscribed on the culture, who's got, um, well, what, what has the most writing on it in this? The car, right. Clearly the car is an object which is owned. Who else has writing on them? The driver, right. He's got the most, so he is clearly 
part of the object, which is the car. He belongs to the owner, and the women also have Budweiser on them. So they are all the possessions. Who is the person who's the owner in this picture? The Clearly, the guy with the white shirt. How do we know? He doesn't have anything written on him. He's not owned. He's got a teeny little logo, probably his own name or his own company. Uh, so we can see how this kind of, the more you think about next time you wear a t-shirt, the more writing you carry around in yourself, the more you're really saying that you are allowing yourself to be a billboard for somebody else's purposes and you're owned by them. Also here in this picture, clearly for the owner, the women and the man and the car are all trophies of his success. This image, um, just from last year, shows this woman propped up on the other side of a wall where there's a bicycle on the other side. And uh, you may not be able to read the writing from a distance, but there's the sign in Chinese is translated as, be careful of theft. Community security is important. So the parallel there is that she's an object like the bicycle that might be stolen. She's even leaning sort of at the same angle as the bike. Consider also when you look at such images in terms of the objectification issue, who is the object of another's gaze? Even if the gaze is the person who's looking at the picture. In this case, there's a gaze within that gaze. We are looking at the picture, but there's a man who's looking at the woman. And she's done up kind of like a piece of fruit. So again, the, the concept of woman as to be consumed. This was just on the Super Bowl this year. This was the, touted as the first TV to web teaser ad called Exposure uh, for GoDaddy.com. And uh, what it implied, of course, is that if you go to the website, uh, how many of you actually did go to the website and see what was on there? I did, so it's okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> Of course, I had this reason to go there. Uh, it's it's uh, actually, you go on the website and you're expecting to see her open her jacket all the way. So there's the sort of the teaser that it's going to become real pornography that couldn't be shown on broadcast television. Uh, what in fact it ends up being is uh, a, a rather ironic but funny but nasty play on the word beaver. Um, she doesn't ever actually expose anything but a real beaver. Okay, women as faceless anonymous bodies or body parts. This is a strange phenomenon in our mainstream media that most often when you see a man portrayed in the media doing anything, you see his head and usually his torso or his whole body. But so often when you look at images of women, what you see is a body part or a body with the face obscured. This was a full page ad in the Chicago Tribune, I can't, I couldn't even scan the whole thing. It went all the way down to her, her feet. Um, you opened up, on page three, you open up the paper and wham, there is this woman's butt. And it's an ad for cellulite refining gel. But again, think about the gaze. Who is looking at this picture and why? Why are we seeing a full page ad in the newspaper of a woman's butt? This was in uh, just the last week or two of the New York Times. Um, it was an advertisement for Equinox gyms. And if you look closely, do you see the surgical markings on the, the women on the right and the left? Uh, things are getting a lot more explicit, too. Um, just in the last five years or so, you see more near nudity or nudity in advertising in the United States, in mainstream advertising, than you ever saw before. But the really disturbing thing in this picture is the, the markings to show how they're going to be carved up. And the association that comes to mind when you look at those markings isn't only surgery to, of course, uh, in some sense, violently rearrange their bodies to look like the gal in the middle who's being tantalized by the god, by the god with the grapes, but this association. The carving up of parts of meat. It's 
to go to the headless genre, this was just in uh, a few years ago in the New York Times Fashion of the Times issue. Uh, headless but heady was the caption. And that was in the same issue. What's the effect of taking the head off a person when you put their image in advertising? Right, the, the person, the soul, the, the personality of the person doesn't matter. Their intelligence doesn't matter. Nothing about them matters except the body. There's another one, this is a go, another Gautier ad. And I, I'm not cropping these myself, <laughs> that's how they come. Uh, this was a retrospective of a famous uh, fashion designer where you have sometimes hats are used to obscure the face as high fashion. Sometimes veils. Uh, very strange ad, flower bomb. Is, is her head an explosion? Is it a flower? What is it? It's not human. And this was in the Chicago Tribune, uh, the, the last page, no, I think the Times, the last page of a fashion issue a few years before, uh, playing on the, the idea that the issue is, is finished, it's a wrap, and her face is wrapped in a veil. Start watching, you'll see these, all, you'll see these veiled, wrapped women all over the media. And again, hair as a way of veiling the face. This was an online ad. You can get these women by joining. They become commodities. The only one who really remotely has a personality is the one on the left who also has cleavage. So the question is what you're focusing on there. And the fetishization of one commodity in replacement for the head of a woman. That's a BMW ad. Another genre in this is bad women and ideal women, bad images of women as bossy, bitchy, nag, ageism, not fitting the thin ideal, versus the ideal girl woman inviting incestuous fantasies or anorexic. Here's a bad woman. A solution for those who still think a powerful mower has to be heavy. Here's a good girl. This is an old Brooke Shields ad from when she was still a teenager, uh, dressed as a little girl with Mary Jane's a, a sort of school uniform, but sort of unbuttoned with her thigh showing on a swing, which actually mirrors um, a, a very large genre within actual pornography of not only child pornography, but women posing as children in pornography in much more graphic ways, of course. Kate Moss, the sort of quintessential anorexic type. Again, looking very young, very girlish. They often choose models who are right on the cusp of adulthood for some of these things. And there she is again. Another genre is women as animals linked or linked with animals. And these are usually fused with racist images. Um, Here's an example. You know the do's and don'ts from Glamour magazine, maybe we, the women probably know about these, uh, where they show people who are not doing the fashion trend correctly, and then they show someone who is. Called Jungle Fever. Animal influences are everywhere this season. And the thing that I have noticed time after time, and I've been tracking this for years now, is that in an industry that still uses predominantly white models, Almost every time some kind of animal skin or print is used, suddenly a woman of color comes out as the model, or is, is used as a model. There's another one. And what's, what's the um, obvious sort of psychological undercurrent of the idea of animal prints and women? What's the message underneath that? Stalk them, okay, they're to be hunted. What else? 
to tame them, right? They need to be tamed. So the, the message is that they're, they're wild animals. And of course, the subtext is they're sexually wild and uncontrolled and need to be tamed. But first, you can hunt them. I didn't put any images on here, but there's a whole thing on the internet uh, called Hunting Bambi. How many of you have heard about Hunting Bambi? Well, there was a controversy that apparently some uh, rich ranch owner was actually sending nude women out into his ranch and then letting pe men pay $10,000 to go out and hunt them with paintball guns. Uh, but then the controversy died because it turned out that they were just videos that recreated that as a reality show that was faked. And so then it was kind of like the media said, oh, so no problem. But you can buy those videos, Hunting Bambi and Hunting Bambi 2, to this day, where it simulates a hunt of naked women in the wild uh, being paintballed, dragged off, and having other things done to her. So that's all part of this genre of, of hunting the sexually wild woman. This is the worst one I've ever found on the wild side. And again, notice how this woman clothed in reptile is also an African-American woman. So you've got the double whammy of women are sexual animals to begin with, but of course women of color are even more wild, untamable sexual beings. Now, images of overt violence against women also appear in the mainstream media as humor. This is a Kate Spade ad just a couple of years back. It's obviously the William Tell story where she's got the apple on her head. The, the, the object of desire here is a purse, but she's also a, a target herself. An ad for an old, uh, thankfully failed <laughs> share movie, Faithful. After 20 years of marriage, she thought she was the target of her husband's affection. She was only half right. And we think of the New Yorker cartoons as very sophisticated. This one says, during the next commercial, I'm going to belt you one. Images of overt violence against women as entertainment. We're all familiar with the war so-called wardrobe malfunction moment, where it was interesting to analyze the rhetoric in the aftermath of that event, because who primarily ended up taking responsibility? Who got blamed and who took responsibility? She did. Right. And if you watch the whole clip, it looks pretty clear that what's going on there is an enactment of violence. It's not just a willing shedding of clothing. Eroticized images of bondage. By the way, um, one, root, one un definition of the root word of pornography, pornoi, actually means slaves or sexual slaves. Look at this image from Boucheron. This is the, the women's perfume from Boucheron uh, called Jaipur. Uh, again, kind of a, in this case, a uh, colonial kind of image of Orientalism where it becomes exotic and sexual because it's Asian. And where do you see there? You don't see the heads. So again, you have the headless woman. You have the body parts. You have her being bound by some rich, beautiful piece of jewelry. There's no picture of perfume anywhere in that ad. So the whole thing is evoking an atmosphere of eroticized, orientalized violence. <coughs> This is the men's perfume that appeared on the very next page in the same magazine, the men's cologne by Boucheron. What's different about that? What? <laughs> what? Name it. <laughs> okay, if you're to take any body part out of context that would perhaps not suggest just being used, the hand is the one body part that suggests agency because we do things with our hands. So, you have a body part, yes, but it's the body part that represents agency. It's clothed, right? Richly clothed. He's, well, he's either receiving it or he's tossing it up and down. You know, he's, he's so privileged that he can toy with rich things. There is cologne in the picture. And 
if you contrast who's passive and who's active, which is the more active image? Obviously. Okay, so those are the kinds of things you can look at, who's passive, who's active, where, who has agency, who does not. Um, and here, another image of uh, suggesting bondage. A lot, there's a lot of dog collar images out there in mainstream media. Sexualized bondage. And then images of overt violence against women as fashion. And these are the hardest ones to look at. Uh, this one says it won't take the place of some professional help. This is a Redken ad. It was a full page ad. It was also part of a window pane ad with several images in it. Um, the play on words here, obviously we think of professional help, we think of going to a psychologist or a therapist. And her hair, her head is being whacked by the hairdresser, uh, presumably to fluff it, but the real message is uh, a subtle message around the victims of violence who need professional help, which again sort of suggests that the victims of violence are the ones who are crazy. Whatever happened to cherries in the snow? Lip colors called frostbite, asphyxia, and bruise. Eye makeup, shattered and roach. Nail polish, plague and mildew. This image um, was actually a central uh, image in the middle of a page of text in Time magazine to talk about snuff pornography on the net. Now the article itself was a good article that was expressing some outrage and, and some concern about the growing phenomenon of snuff pornography on the net. Uh, snuff pornography, for those of you who don't know, is where uh, a woman is brought in presumably to shoot a regular pornographic film and then in the course of the shooting of the film is actually tortured and killed. We don't even know how many of these are simulated and how many of them are real, but they've been out there for quite a long time and now they're all over the place on the internet as well. So um, the problem with this article, with this image, is that any five-year-old kid can pick up a Time magazine off the coffee table and look at this image, not read the words, but see the image. And the image itself is incredibly tantalizing and fuses violence with eroticism in the image itself coming out of the computer screen. This was a full page Vogue ad. This one kind of brings it all together. You see the reptile hot pants, so there's the connection with woman and animal. She's wearing a dog collar of sorts, which creates the connection to bondage. Her clothes are half pulled off her body. She's lying in a pile of trash. She appears to be dead, or at least unconscious. And do you all see the, the man's sneakered foot on her arm, on the right side of the image? There is a very odd and growing subgenre of um, murdered women as high fashion imagery. And I'm going to show you the, the most disturbing images come next. These are from last year's, last spring's America's Next Top Model. How many of you saw the episode that you think I'm... I didn't do these as full screen images. There's actually uh, six or seven of them all in total. Um, they were all stabbed by a model, drowned by a model, um, shot by a model, and so forth. And all of them had to simulate being murder victims and Tyra Banks's comment at the end of that episode was, great work, girls, very high fashion. Which is a little surprising because in some, some of the episodes, what Tyra Banks does is somewhat more socially conscious. She's, she's not that um, monolithically insensitive. OK, uh, we're going to come back to that in a minute. I just don't want to leave it on that image. So help. What's our way out? If we don't live in denial and we dare to say that as people of faith and as pastoral caregivers, we are called to be God's lovers and reconcilers, how can we face each other? How can we bridge these separate realities? How can we ever talk to each other about how much we care, 
talk about justice, talk about equality. How can we as women and men talk to each other with tenderness and compassion in this context? Well, I think there are some ways we can. In this work of justice and compassion, I believe we're called to do four things. First, we have to see and hear the truth. There are a lot of reasons why we don't want to, but perhaps the most compelling is that in addition to the social inertia of which Judith Herman wrote, if we were to acknowledge all this violence all the time, it would be too terrible. Who could bear to know this? We blame the victims because then we can imagine they did something to bring the violence upon themselves that we are too smart enough or too good enough to do. If violence against women and sexual abuse are not as rare as we wish they were, and many of you know from your own experience that they aren't so rare, then we must face the truth that all women, and indeed a great many men, are vulnerable. There's no profile that makes one woman more vulnerable to violation than another. We are all vulnerable. And it, that is the mostly subliminal reality with which we live on a daily basis. Even this subliminal awareness manifests itself differently between women and men. Imagine yourself going to a deserted parking garage late at night. Most men will admit to being nervous about being mugged. Most women fear being raped. But the violence will never diminish unless we allow ourselves to see it in all its tremendous proportions. And this goes to the heart of pastoral care. Pastoral care is much more than one pastor sitting and listening compassionately to another person, as valuable and core to our work as that is. Pastoral care also involves creating a context for care that establishes safety, honesty, and a commitment to promoting justice and dignity throughout the entire community. And we do not only provide pastoral care to individuals and couples and families, but we are called simultaneously to work in community to surround those individuals, couples, and families with a holding environment of safety and justice that mirrors the realm of God. This is public theology, and it is our eschatological hope. How do we actually do it? In very concrete ways, it means doing and continuing to do what many of you and your local congregations have already begun in many places, putting out posters and flyers and pamphlets, conveying that the church, this church, intends to be a safe place for all people. What are the biblical mandates and what are the ecclesial policies that will ensure that safety and the true hospitality of the gospel? The former Commission for Women of the ELCA in particular has created some excellent resources for this purpose. It also means preaching and teaching and offering small groups and Bible studies that include lessons about sexual abuse and all forms of violence against women until our students and parishioners may come to know and trust that this is a safe place and we are safe people to really talk about what happens in women's lives. It means asking the right questions when we see frightened behavior, fri behaviors that signal us sometimes at just a gut level that something's not right. It means being alert to the statistical reality that if one in five women are survivors of sexual abuse, one in three are raped, and as many as one half are battered, then proportionately as many women in our congregations and here, right here in our seminary community, are also victims and survivors and they are waiting for a word of hope and solidarity and healing from each of us. Second, we must name sexual abuse and exploitation as violence. When we first hear a woman tell us of an experience of sexual assault or battering or harassment or sexual exploitation, we have to remind ourselves to shift the focus off all the ways that we are socialized to question her to doubt her, to wonder what she did wrong, or what in her psychological makeup made her especially vulnerable. We need to hold the focus on the person responsible, the one who chose to cross the line and act with violence. Notice, uh, even in the media, the way violence against women is represented that subtly continues to blame the victim. In this article in the Chicago Tribune, her search for love led to grisly end. It was her search for love not the perpetrator's violence. Um, there's a couple of quotes within it. 
Since Evan's death, friends and family have tried to reconcile the bubbly high school girl they once knew with the woman who bounced in and out of relationships with abusive men, so she's promiscuous, um, a woman whose lifestyle choices alienated her family and ultimately seemed to lead to her violent death. There's no mention anywhere in there of the choices, the lifestyle choices of her batterer. And in this article um, in the New York Times metro section, a girl 12 is sexually assaulted while taking shortcut in Queens. Notice how the passive voice, she is sexually assaulted. Um, she was attacked. There is a sense in which um, there's this unnamed anonymous perpetrator who doesn't even exist grammatically in the sentence. The focus is on her in the passive voice, again suggesting that somehow it's about what she did, not about what the perpetrator did. So we need to be careful and notice these subtle ways in which the, the society continues to perpetuate the blaming of the victim. Third, we must move beyond helplessness, beyond sympathy, and even beyond anger to justice for victims and survivors. This means entering the public arena to challenge the images of women that distort women's full dignity and humanity. Write an op-ed piece. Write a letter to the editor. Every time you see something where you notice this going on. It means taking responsibility as Christian community and as church leaders to say to offenders that sexual violation and exploitation is never acceptable under any circumstances, and we will stand for the righting of these wrongs, both in our policies and in our own personal relationships. Finally, we are called to restore right relation, not just between individual men and women, and not in the sense of premature forgiveness or cheap grace, but in the sense of the whole community, the whole society. We're called to make connections between violence against women and all forms of violence, racism, heterosexism, classism, able-bodyism, and all the forms of oppression that serve to maintain structures of power and privilege at the expense of the majority of the planet's people and creatures. Taking all that into consideration then, our goal is, goal is not a gender-blind pastoral care in which we simply treat women and men alike, nor is it our goal to be colorblind or neutral toward all the various differences of an individual's culture, identity, age, sexuality, physical ability, but a gender and culturally sensitive pastoral care that recognizes all the unique particularities of each person's life and celebrates them as precious in God's sight. To close, the theologian Martin Buber wrote, inscrutably involved, we live in currents of universal reciprocity. It is this I-thou relationship that refuses to brand any person as an it and replaces aggression and domination with truth-telling, relationality, and care. Objectification is the root of all violence. Thank God we are now talking about these things in seminaries like ours and in the wider church. It's a great sign of hope to me that indeed in our religious communities and here as, as we are gathered tonight as a faithful community of educators, pastors, and especially those of you who are on the cutting edge preparing for lay and ordained ministry, we are finally in many places breaking silence and taking up our calling to speak truth to power. If God, we believe, is relational in God's very essence, in God's very heart, then by being relational in our daily walk, by speaking truth, we reverse patterns of privilege and discrimination, patterns of domination and objectification, and we enter into possibilities for true relationship. This is the heart of all pastoral care. It's only as we move out of denial and into genuine relatedness, I believe, in mutual concern and agape love, that we will find the means to safety and community for all people, women and men alike. Thank you.